This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Welcome to a special edition of Real Talk, Alberta's Premier Danielle Smith in our studio in 30 seconds. We'll get to our questions, your questions, submitted to talk at ryanjesperson.com as Danielle Smith joins us. want to let you know very quickly that this episode is happening with the support of our friends at We Know Training. And this is a story that's been in the news over the past while, regardless of industry. You've probably heard credential fraud is on the rise. Uh, it's impacting healthcare with nurses. It's impacting the energy industry with oil patch workers. It's impacting the care of our seniors with personal support workers. There's no shortage of headlines where fake credentials are putting people's safety at risk. Luckily, there's an innovative technology that's making credential fraud a thing of the past. It's called digital verifiable credentials. They're secure. They're cloud-based. They go way beyond traditional certificates, PDFs. You can't forge them. You can't falsify or alter them. They're tamper-proof and independently verifiable, trusted, real-time digital credentials that can be viewed, managed, and shared from anywhere. And with We Know Training, they plug seamlessly into your training courses. If this is resonating with you and you want to learn more about using verifiable credentials in your training or credentialing program, just visit verifiablecredentials.ca. As we welcome Alberta's Premier Danielle Smith to studio on the heels, less than 24 hours from a meeting, a sit down with uh, your number one enemy, say the political watchers, the Liberal Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, who made a trip to Calgary uh, to talk to you and make a couple announcements along the way. How did the meeting go? It, it went well. It was cordial. And look, I, I would not call, characterize him that way. I think that if you want to look at who... I don't have a good relationship with its Environment Minister Stephen Gibo. Even though I've tried, I mean, I did try for a year to work with him collaboratively, but it's impossible because he's so ideological. And so, but with the with the Prime Minister, we've been able to find a number of places that we're able to to collaborate on. And so, the ones that I wanted to raise with him are first off, Japan and South Korea are coming very close to doing uh, a request for proposals on an ammonia supply for 20 years, and we have the ability in partnership with British Columbia using the CN line on Port-au-Prince Rupert to be the preferred supplier. So I wanted to make sure that we could get a signal from the federal government that they were going to work with us on that. I wanted to thank him for Trans Mountain Pipeline. That is going to be a major game changer for us in the province because it uh, not only will allow us to get our, our product to the coast, it'll also reduce the the price of, of, of uh, or reduce the differential between WTI and WCS. And so that's going to have a huge impact on our, our budget. I also told him that we have had a great relationship with First Nations that have allowed us to use our Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation to backstop several different programs. And we've increased that to $3 billion, knowing that we may have to help to de-risk some of the, um, uh, the the sale of that of the line getting back into Indigenous hands. So I told them we'd be on standby to assist with the national program should that one develop. We have Pathways, which is another area that we are, are working on. Uh, we put forward our carbon capture utilization and storage tax credit as I promised, and we're looking to see if we'll get more certainty about what the federal program looks like. Uh, First Nations as well, um, they were disappointed. I had to let him know that when he came to Edmonton to announced the housing announcement that First Nations weren't included, even though it's many Treaty 6 um, uh, residents and citizens who are going to be impacted by that. And Enoch is a nation that only gets like $895,000 worth of housing grants. So I, I told him we want to play that role with First Nations being their advocate. And uh, I hope we could work together on that. Plus the carbon tax. I said it would be a massive political win for him with all of the, the premiers almost uh, uniform across the board coming out saying, don't increase at April 1st. And I don't know that we had much success, but you can see Doug Ford is weighing in. Even Wam Canoe, when he was asked, why haven't you weighed in on this? His answer was, who says we haven't? Mm. So if you've got NDP, Liberal, Conservative, all across the board saying, don't increase this April 1st, that gives him a lot of cover to do the right thing. So those are the things that we talked about. Yeah, is it true that you asked him to fire Stephen Gilbo? Yes, I mean, I've been asking for it publicly, and so I thought I should tell him that it would really reset our relationship if we could have a different person in that They're role. They're chums, though. They go way back. What did he say to you? No. 
well, he laughed. I think he knew that I that uh, that I think he knows that minister is creating problems for him. And you know, to his credit, he's going to to d- defend one of his ministers. But look, it's not just me. I mean, when you've got Doug Ford and David Eby both outraged that he would give a a speech saying that we're not going to build big highway projects anymore, and that's one of the main jobs of the federal government. Then I would say that uh, that that he's taking. I said, look, he's causing you more damage than he's causing me. Yeah. And if you want to reset with all of the provinces on some reasonable policy that will get us to a 2050 emissions reduction target, I think you have to remove him. Um, obviously, I didn't have the impact that I that I'd hoped on that on, one, uh, but I needed to raise it with him. Sure. Yeah. On, on February 21st, when we talked to the prime minister, he asked him about the no new roads thing, and he s- clarified, said it was a comment about Quebec. People can check out his full comments in our archives. I have to assume that you talked to the prime minister about pharmacare and. And uh, hmm. there, there's a lot of people we've, we've got, um, you know, questions submitted uh, to our email inbox, hundreds of them, in fact. And a lot of people are concerned that you're letting politics get in the way of what they believe would be good for Albertans. Um, how can you assure Albertans that you've got their back on pharmacare? What did the conversation with the PM look like? What, what I told him is that how, we wouldn't want to participate in creating a separate program that only covers two types of conditions. I said, well, we could work with you on trying to find a way to expand our existing program to cover more people. We do have a problem and I think it's a problem across the country that there are in our province I'm, I'm told by my officials it's about 24 percent of people that aren't covered by any program we've got our own pharmacare program for seniors those on age those who have disabilities then there are a number of different private plans but for one reason or another there's 24 percent of people who aren't covered and so if we can work together to expand our existing 5,000 drug policy to include more of those people, I'd be very happy to work with them on that. But I don't want to create a, a separate program that only t- covers two conditions because we do cover uh, diabetes in our program. Is, we, and is we do cover you, though, birth control. Is, is part of you just inherently opposed to, to working with the feds or having the feds administer a program like this? Like, is it a non-starter for you? Look, if, if I was going around setting up military installations all over Alberta, people would say, hey, that's not your jurisdiction. You don't know what you're doing there. Then w- why don't they say the same thing with the federal government. The federal government doesn't know how to implement a pharmacare program. They, that is not their area of jurisdiction. That is provincial jurisdiction. We have the experience of going through and developing protocols about how we're going to add drugs to the list, how we're going to make sure that we cover our most vulnerable. And I can tell you, engineering a program that only covers two conditions is an indication to me that they have not given fulsome thought to this. That is not a universal program. A universal program would be what do you currently cover? Now, how do we expand it to include more people? And that's that's what I what I want to get involved in the conversation with. And I, you know, I gave an example yesterday in a press conference. My dad is on the government Alberta Blue Cross program. He has seven drugs that he's on. He doesn't have diabetes, so insulin is not one of them. He doesn't need birth control. Uh, he needs seven other types of drugs. And I suspect most people are in that condition that they, if they need one type of drug, they probably need a couple of others. And that's why we have to not. Uh, we have to be honest with people about what is being proposed. If we want a universal program, it has to cover more conditions than just two. Um, uh, talking about, I mean, I'm not drawing a straight line from setting up military bases to a provincial police service, but Bill 11 uh, tabled in the Alberta legislature on Wednesday. Uh, we're talking to the premier on Thursday. If you're listening to this uh, yesterday, if passed, it obviously will be, would update legislation to form what the province terms an independent agency police service that would take on some of the roles the government's passed on in recent years to Alberta sheriffs. Uh, on the surface, it looks like the first steps toward establishing a provincial police force. I thought that you were past that. I thought that this was a settled matter. It's not? I would say that we have our sheriffs doing policing functions. This is the thing that Mike Ellis realized when he came in. Because remember, um, Mike Ellis came from the Calgary Police Service. Mm -hmm. And he said, my goodness, do we ever train these guys well? With a couple of extra weeks of training, they'll be up to the same level as any police service. But they're not given that same parity when they go into other jurisdictions. They're not given the same parity when they uh, go to other types of services. They're not given the same parity when they need to be called in for uh, for, for support. Um, if you have a sheriff doing highway patrol and somebody is stealing equipment off a neighboring farm and they're the closest to respond, they should be able to, to respond. That's the kind of interoperability that we need to have. In addition, we've embedded them in Edmonton and Calgary to work alongside with Edmonton Police. We've got Fugitive Apprehension, that is a new program that we're setting up. We're talking about creating new units for fentanyl, for cross-border issues. You saw with British Columbia, we're seeing safe supply 
uh, products that are destined for our market coming in. The RCMP did a release on that a couple of days ago. So there are already policing functions that the sheriffs are doing. And when you have your police force doing policing functions, it's not appropriate for politicians to direct that. Whenever you have policing functions, you set up an independent citizen civilian oversight commission and so that they can do the, di the direction, they can do the oversight, they can also do the negotiations. So we have to move towards, as we're professionalizing our sheriffs, giving them more policing roles, it's just proper governance to give them the, uh, the, the same oversight that you would for an Edmonton Police Service or a Calgary Police Service. You have no doubt heard the criticism coming from former Calgary Mayor Ned Nenshi, who wants to be the leader of the official opposition, ultimately wants to be Premier of Alberta. He uh, joined me a couple of days ago on this show, and here's what he had to say. This is Ned Nenshi talking about you. $14,000 a bottle on Tylenol when the federal government had already ordered some just so you could own the libs. A hundred million dollars on the failed privatization of Dynalife. Nine million dollars on advertising for the Alberta pension plan, something that in the election she said she would never do. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And, you know, yesterday I had a very busy day. Uh, so I didn't have I haven't had a chance yet to look at what they're suggesting they're going to fix in the utility system, but what they broke in the utility system has caused utility bills to quadruple in Alberta to be by far the highest in Canada. Our insurance rates, our auto insurance rates are something like two and a half times what they are in Saskatchewan next door. This is direct results of UCP government policy, setting aside the crisis in family doctors, the closure of emergency rooms, the fact that here in one of the wealthiest jurisdictions in the world, you can't be guaranteed that you'll get an ambulance when you call 911 when you're in need. This is sheer incompetence combined with the lack of any moral fiber. And, you know, I will call them on that every single day. Sheer incompetence and a lack of moral fiber. How would you <laughs> respond to that? Well, look, I, when I got elected, there were a lot of problems um, stemming from many, many years of inaction by previous governments. I've been in 17 months and my attitude about governance is that our job is to talk with stakeholders, identify problems and start to fix them. And so we begun to start to fix uh, all kinds of things in health services. Happy to talk to you about that. Uh, all, we've begun to fix the chronic problems that we've had in uh, utilities since the early phase out of coal, which incidentally happened under the NDP without a plan to make sure that we had enough base load power once that all came off stream. That's the reason why we've had the spike in, in utility rates. We're, we, we, in fact, as well, saw uh, an issue in, in Calgary. Uh, there, They got an extra $165 million because because of the way they set their municipal franchise fees. So they were compounding on top of that the, uh, the, the cost of electricity. I just mentioned that because that's an issue I've been advocating against since 2006. And, you know, Calgary Council could have done something about that when uh, that person who was just speaking was the, was the mayor. Uh, so I would say that, look, th there are, are no doubt lots of problems that we have to fix, but my government is going to identify what the issues are. We are going to tackle them straight on and we're going to fix them. That's what we're going to do. He's calling you immoral and dangerous. That's, that's not your average everyday political critique. That's next level. What I would also say is, but one of the things I find interesting about all of the leadership candidates for the NDP is that none of them want to run on their record. I noticed that during the election with, with Rachel Notley as well, as I thought, this is so strange. I'm running on my record, including some of the great things that my predecessor did, and but she's running away from her. She's not talking about all the great things that she did when they were in government. And it's because it's not a great record. They campaigned saying that they were gonna balance the budget right? They actually ran up $80 billion worth of debt. Part of the issue we have right now is we've got three and a half billion dollars worth of finance charges just as interest rates are going up and all that debt comes up for renewal. They didn't run on a carbon tax. They brought it in. And now you've got NDP candidates in the leadership race saying, oh, whoops, that was a mistake. I guess we are we're gonna, we have to run a million miles away from that. They increased corporate taxes. They increased income taxes. We had 13 quarters of out-migration which is part of the reason why we've now had to work on catching up with some of the infrastructure now that people want to be here and are moving back in. So I would say that the, the NDP um, needs to kind of figure out who they are because it sounds to me like you've got some candidates saying they didn't want to disconnect from the federal party, some candidates saying they're running away from traditional policy that they've always had, others saying they want a name change, others saying they want a brand change, others saying they want a color change. 
I will wait to see what the new version of the NDP looks like at the end of this after they go through their process and decide what they want to be. And then we can talk policy. No income tax cut in this budget like you promised. Uh, you've kicked that uh, down the road. Household finance is obviously the number one concern for a lot of people right now. Why didn't your government take the necessary steps to keep that commitment to Albertans? There's a, there's a few things. Um, I, my finance minister came to me early on and said that he was nervous about what was happening with oil and gas prices and that we've become very reliant on oil and gas. When I look at our long-term reliable revenue stream, it only grows at about 4% per year. And yet our, our spending has been growing above that. And so what happens is when there's a mismatch, you end up relying more and more on resource revenues. Then if resource revenues take a dive, now all of a sudden you're back into deficits and borrowing. So we've developed a strategy. It's a long-term strategy where we can slowly start shrinking the amount that we're re relying on resource revenues, start growing the heritage funds so that it provides a new source of investment income and moderate our spending. I, I, I directed our, our ministers that we, we could not increase your overspending uh, more than 3.9% this year. And so those are the kinds of actions that are going to create the room for our revenues to grow faster than our expenditures so that we can create that room for the tax cut. We think we can, uh, we can do that uh, within uh, so that the first part of the tax cut will be implemented in January 2026 and the second part will fully implemented in and January 2027. The, the cynics smirk and say just in time for an election. It's like right out of the politics playbook. Look, I, I have never felt that uh, when you when you run on a platform, everything has to be implemented within the first seven months. I mean, keep in mind, we just got reelected last May, had to put in new ministers who were uh, who were designing the, uh, their strategy. We had to do, we have two different sessions of legislature we had to go through. And so I, I think people understand uh, that we've got to make sure that our number one promise that we would not run deficits, our number one promise is kept. And so I, I, the sense I'm getting is people understand that. They know that we're going to Im implement the tax. It'll be in place before the next election. And uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we're on a pathway to reduce debt, hopefully get down to zero and increase sa savings mm -hmm. so that it can ultimately replace our reliance on resource revenues. You didn't campaign on an Alberta pension plan. By every metric, it appears to be unpopular with the public. Uh, have you officially made a decision on that? Have you, have you ruled it out? Is this something you're still thinking about? We haven't heard much about a provincial pension plan from your office, from the legislature. I, I always said I'd release the plan. And if we made a decision, it would be up to Albertans to decide. Uh, that was what the direction was of the Fair Deal panel. Again, this process predated me. They had already gone through it, had an interim report. We knew the final report was coming. We got it June 2023. I released it. Um, I'm, I'm persuaded by it. So if it did go to a referendum, I think that the, the fact that we could potentially save Albert, Albertans and Alberta businesses $5 billion a year, I think that that's a, a compelling argument. But it's your decision to send it to referendum or not. It's, it, you know, and I'm not getting the sense that Albertans have enough information to move to a referendum at the moment. And so what, what, that's one of the things that, that we determined is that we've looked at the, we hired LifeWork, which is a, an, uh, it's a firm that has a lot of credibility. It used to be more no Chappelle. So it's not like we went out and chose somebody that we thought was going to agree with us. They looked at the legislation. They looked at what our year over year overpayment of benefit of uh, premiums is versus what our, our seniors need for benefits. They looked at the year over year compound interest on that and came to the decision uh, the determination that we were entitled to 53% of the fund. Now the federal government's disputed that it's gone to the chief actuary. They're hiring three people to take a look at the at the results and do a calculation of their own, and they'll get back to us in the fall. And once we have that number, then we'll have a better idea of what contribution rates would be, what the benefits would be, uh, what the asset transfer would be. And then I'll have a better idea of whether or not Albertans want it to go to a vote. What's going on with coal mining in the Rockies? I know your energy minister, Brian Jean, mm -hmm. has said that there's just exploration happening there. Everybody's paying attention to Grassy Mountain, Eastern Slopes. It's, it's obviously, I mean, it riles up even Southern Alberta conservatives when you start yeah. talking about threats to the watershed and the like. Uh, Gene says it's just exploration, but you don't explore if you're not planning on mining there. Uh, I think a lot of Albertans uh, assume that this isn't going to happen, but it looks like it is. So what's the deal? I, I guess we have to go back to, to what happened when the 1976 coal policy was rescinded. What happened was that a lot of exploratory work was being done on Category 2 lands, which were pristine lands, which, and I've been to one of the, uh, the site where one of the, those developments would have been, you would have had 
to drive in 60 miles on a back road. All the infrastructure that would have needed to be laid to mine out that area would have caused way too much impact on the environment. So we put the, the uh, 1976 coal policy back on, but there were four advanced projects, Grassy Mountain Tent and then two up in the Grand Cache Hinton area that were uh, allowed to continue on through the process. So uh, so we're allowing the AER to, to, to do the work, go through the process. I believe in that particular one, uh, they're looking at ways in which they can do uh, see if they can recover it in a different way. Because here's the issue that I understand down there is that the problem is if you do open face mining and then it rains, then all of the selenium will wash into the watershed. And that's what the ranches are concerned about. But if you can find a way to mine without having to have that exposure and you can eliminate the issues around selenium, recover what is actually not a very well recovered site, then is that something that uh, the residents are, are prepared to do? I, th I believe that's the nature of the application that they're making to see if they can mine it in a different way so that it, it has no impact on the, on the water. So I, again, that's a regulatory process. I am not a technical expert, but those four projects right from the very beginning were, were, were given, because they were advanced, were given the opportunity to make the case to the regulator. On, uh, it appears that you, you obviously oil and gas is incredibly important to Alberta. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows where you stand on it. Everybody knows where, in particular, conservative premiers are expected to stand on having the back of oil and gas and being friendly with oil and gas. It appears that you'll, you'll bend over backwards for coal or support coal. But at the same time, there's like an ideological or maybe not. I'm curious to see how you'll answer this. But like an ideological barrier that stops you from being bullish on wind and solar and other renewable forms of energy. This moratorium's just been lifted. There's new policy in place. Not everybody's satisfied. We got a lot of emails from people saying this is threatening billions of dollars in investment. How do you see the future of renewables in Alberta, honestly? Uh I should tell people where I sort of come from on this issue because when I got a lot, when I was in office the first time, I went down to the to the U.S. The State Department had me um, it hosted me to visit a number of different jurisdictions, and one of them was Montana. And what I learned in Montana was that they their intermittent power, um, if it was going to be on their grid, they had to firm it up. Meaning if you offer 50 megawatts of power, you've got to always op offer 50 megawatts of power. That means you have need to have partnerships with other types of energy providers like natural gas peaker plants, or you have to have reliable uh, backup in terms of maybe a water battery storage like some jurisdictions have, or, or have a battery storage to be able to back it up. And so the problem that we have now is that there isn't any of that redundancy that's built into these types of systems. It's um, we, we now have a point where we're adding on potentially more solar and wind then we have base load power to, mac to back it up. And we saw that on January the 13th, when at five o'clock at night, there was no solar being generated, seven megawatts of wind being generated of 6,200 megawatts installed. There were a couple of plants that because of the mechanical, uh, the weather, they, they, they were offline for whatever reason, but we had 12,252 megawatts needed, virtually all of that coming from natural gas with a, a bit of a hand from from uh, Saskatchewan on their, on their coal development. And so, that's what we have to be concerned of. We have to manage the system so that we know that in the dead of winter, minus 35, when we have no wind or solar, that we have enough base load to be able to back it up. So as long as we can make sure that they're developing at the same time, then we'll be able to bring on um, a, a responsible amount of solar and wind. Yeah, and it's Alberta's supposed to be the open for business mm -hmm. jurisdiction, the no red tape jurisdiction, and and this one, this file just it, it just seems to fly in the face of that, you know. Well, let me quote Andrew Leach. I know he's probably surprised I'm quoting him because he doesn't often agree with our government, but we have thirty three thousand megawatts of wind and solar in the queue and virtually no natural gas. So let's play this out and assume that I agree to all th or I the a regulator agreed to all thirty three thousand megawatts of wind and solar. So then on January 13th, when it's minus 35 and there's no wind and no solar, we are just as hooped as we were right now. You have to have base load power coming on. And I can tell you when I talk to some of the uh, natural gas uh, generators, those who want to bring on new base load power, one of the things they say is because of the federal clean electricity regs, because of the potential that this is going to have to be shut in or shut down in 10 years time, we can't convince anyone to lend us money to build a natural gas station on that on that on that basis. That's why we're fighting with Gibo over this. If we want to bring on more wind and solar, 
we have to bring on more natural gas peaker plants to back them up. That's that's just the way our market works. There's, uh, I mean, there have been a ton of reports. People can Google it that Alberta's energy regulator has grossly underestimated the looming cost of cleaning up Alberta's abandoned mm-hmm. wells, the so-called orphan wells. I got an email from Will who wants me to ask you, while the new liability management framework is nice in theory, uh, what steps will you, what steps will the province take to help both the AER and the orphan well fund actually enforce the regulations. Mm -hmm. I don't think Albertans have confidence in the energy regulator. I think Albertans are concerned and maybe don't even fully realize yet what this environmental liability looks like. Uh, How is it landing with you? Well, I think it's about $30 billion from what I have seen, Uh, whether that's low or high. I guess we have to do a little bit more work on it. And it's a huge liability. And you know, what I've said is the, the framework we're putting in place for solar and wind, where they have to set aside a little bit of money each year of operation so that they have enough money for the reclamation at the end. That's probably the kind of proposal we should have put in place from the very beginning for oil and natural gas. Because the problem we have now is a lot of these wells that are inactive get transferred along with producing assets. And then if a company tips over and goes bankrupt like Sequoia or Trident or Houston, there's any number of them, then those inactive wells go to the orphan well fund and then it balloons the costs that have to be paid for recovery and we, we've got to deal with both those the the ones that are are truly uh orphaned and the ones that are currently inactive so we'll be talking with the energy industry about uh, what we need to do on a go forward with new wells that are being drilled because you know my preference would be to have parity in how we approach that if we're going to be asking solar and wind to do that we should be asking oil and gas companies to do that that being said that doesn't solve our historic liability issue. Our historic liability issue is one that we've mandated that companies have to spend 3% of their liability down every year. And it was seven, it's now at $700 million. The first year, they reached that target. So we're going to keep making sure that they reach that target. So if you do the math on that, 700 million a year, it's, it's still gonna take 40 years to clear off that liability. So maybe we have to do a little bit more, but I've be, I came into politics as a landowner advocate. In 1997, I have known of this inactive well problem for for 25 years, and we're going to solve it because we have to, because we are in a position now with the increase in oil and gas prices. Companies are flush; they've got dollars. Uh, this is the time for us to start building out that secondary industry of making sure that we clean those wells up, develop the technology that then can be exported internationally because every jurisdiction has this problem. And I, I think that we can be leaders in it. I'm not sure if you heard, but there's reports that Red Deer Catholic School Board has banned the use of pronouns in staff emails or course outlines. There's zero mm-hmm. tolerance for flying pride flags. Uh, is, is that in the spirit of the policies that you recently announced or does that concern you? It concerns me. I mean, look, we want to create safe and caring spaces for kids. We do. And we want kids to be able to have the opportunity to, to talk to their friends, talk to a trusted teacher. If they're having uh, if they're having issues going through puberty, if they have same sex attraction, if they have gender identity um um, struggles. Th- those are important uh, conversations to have. What, where, our, where we're going is that when a child makes the choice to come out to the school community, change their pronouns, change who they are, you have to have parents included in that conversation. So I would say that the, the, perhaps they're, they're going in a, in a direction that is, uh, that is inconsistent with what it is that we're, we're trying to do. We want to make sure that all kids feel safe. No one is, is outed and that we we have a a process in place to to help kids as they're going through these struggles. What did you say to David Parker? Um, You see his big, take back Alberta founder for people that aren't familiar, he had a big mea culpa, he tweeted like a week ago, said after my conversation with Danielle Mm -hmm. Smith, yada, 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 you might describe it as his come to Jesus moment, talked about his faith, talked about how he's hurting his movement uh, by by, slamming people's character online. I'm curious Mm -hmm. to know what you told him. He asked me um, if I thought he was, he said his wife thought he was being mean when he made comments about Sarah Hoffman. And I said, your wife is right. You were being mean. Um, I I told him as well that uh, when he attacked Anita Polyev, he'd gone too far and it was inappropriate and I'm not going to be associated or defend those kinds of, those kinds of comments. That is not who I am. I am the type of person, as are you. I mean, maybe it's because we've been in talk radio. You can have differences of opinion on issues, 
but you have to be respectful in how you engage. And so I, I told him to cancel his Twitter and go go talk to somebody to find out why he's so angry. So mm. <laughs> that was my last conversation with him. Uh, we could talk for another hour. <laughs> I've got a ton of questions we're leaving on the on the table. Let me ask you a quick one in closing. What's the plan? Edmonton's hospitals are in real trouble. And I know it's not apples and apples to compare Calgary's arena and 300 odd million there and whatever they're saying, 5 billion. I find that hard to believe on a South Edmonton it hospital. It was crazy, $4.9 billion. I, mean, I, I have to believe we can build a hospital for less than $5 so billion. I. dollars. 100%. But Edmonton's hospitals are in real trouble. The Miz, the Grey Nuns, the Royal Alex. Everybody knows Royal Alex is like 60 years old. Yeah. So what's the plan for Edmonton? I know Edmonton didn't send a bunch of conservative MLAs to the legislature, but Edmonton really needs a hospital. I, well, look, um, Edmonton is a high priority for us. We, we, sp we try to spend exactly the same amount on capital spending in Calgary as we do in Edmonton, whether it's for LRT, whether it's for Grant McEwen, whether it's for Winspear, which we just announced, um, whether it's going to, to assist with the gentrification of the second phase of the Oilers development downtown that's a, we know we may be called upon to do some infrastructure oh, investment sure to assist there and how can we say no and we've actually already indicated to them let us know how we might be able to enable that development because we do want to be fair about it but when it comes to the the hospitals look we went through a really tough time um, with the E. coli outbreak that happened in Calgary but one of the things that made it so great for those kids when they had to go back every day and get tested and wait was that there was a standalone children's hospital that had a very different culture and character and was had the ability with those with those uh with the staff to accommodate those kids in the way they needed to stollery is not a standalone building it's it's got it's um it supports across four different hospitals if if we were to build a standalone stollery which has become the priority for us i think that would give better care to all of those little duffers and it would also free up about 236 beds in university of, uh, of alberta a hospital as well as some of the others um so that to me is is the first step let's get the stollery built let's see how that increases capacity among the four other hospitals that would be impacted by that and then let's do an analysis of what it is we really need because that edmonton uh, south hospital was only supposed to bring on 400 new beds and so we could find 236 new adult beds by doing what i de i described but you'll see this afternoon we're doing a uh, an announcement on alternative level of care patients. Those are patients who are in acute care beds who have to, who should really be in another level of care. They should either be in a mental health um, bed support, addiction bed support, homeless uh, convalescence. The, uh, some are awaiting um, a placement for rental subsidy. Some need to have support with home care or even renovation of their home so that they can return home. And if we were to have a more efficient system for moving those patients out of the out of care, that would be the equivalent of about two to three hospitals the size of Edmonton South. So we've got to make sure that we're building the right types of facilities. If I build a $4.9 billion hospital, it means I can't build more continuing care, mental health beds, mm -hmm. addiction beds. Let's, uh, let's figure out this first and figure out what type of campus Edmonton South is going to be. Maybe there is. Um, a, a core hospital. Maybe it's a hospital in addition to continuing care, mental health and addiction. Maybe it's convalescence facilities so that we can have a place to move cardiac patients while they're recovering before they get sent back home. Those are the kinds of conversations we need to have. We have to stop building expensive acute care beds and then filling them with people who should be in alternative levels of care. Let's build the right facility, staff them the right way with the right people so that we're giving the right, the right level of care. Premier, thanks for your availability. My pleasure. We appreciate Good it. Good to see you. You got it. That's Alberta Premier Danielle Smith here on Real Talk. We'll get to your questions, your response when we come back. Uh, we're going to hand things over to a couple of political commentators, one of them with some experience in elections himself. Graham Thompson will join us, and uh, Jeremy Farkas will join us. Uh, Premier, I think I'll see you later today at the Alberta Chambers of Commerce Political Day of Action. I know there's a lot of your ministers showing up to that. I love that one because it's like if I have a lifeline and I need one of my ministers to answer a tough question that I can't answer, I get to call them up to the mic. It's I, I think fun. it's like you've almost your entire cabinet's showing up to that thing. It's important. Yeah, at the Chateau Lacombe. Thanks for doing see this. You, there. you bet. This conversation happens with the support of real talk partners like our friends at california closets uh, offering custom closets and storage solutions for the entire home california closets experts all the way through from the free design consultation 
through the installation. Nobody does it like they do, whether it's a bedroom, maybe it's a spare room slash home office, a workspace, now that you're working from home more than ever before, a new living area, maybe you want to develop that basement, create an entertainment center for the kids, or of course, your garage. Who doesn't need a little help getting their garage organized? Check out californiaclosets.ca to request your free consultation. If you're investing in your home's exterior, the outdoors, you're looking to bring it to life, your front yard, your backyard, whatever it is, Eden Landscaping wants to talk to you, a custom landscape builder with more than two decades of experience in Edmonton and area. I know I talk a lot about these outdoor kitchens. I'm obsessed with the idea. Maybe a wood-burning forno oven like that pizza oven, maybe a nice pergola over top. Can you just picture the kids coming to visit, the grandkids playing? Maybe you've got one of those water features trickling in the background. Love it. Eden does it all, and they'd love to talk to you, give you an idea of how they work, tell you about their design philosophy. You can book a consultation today with Eden Landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca. Have you figured out your Easter plan yet? Friesen Brothers is inviting you to customize your Easter dinner with their Easter dinner box. As a family, we've gone with this for many years now. It's a perfect solution if you're looking to enjoy food prepared by Red Seal chefs but give your time to your family and friends, your dinner guests. You don't want to be working in the kitchen the whole time. You can treat your family and friends to a special personalized Easter dinner with Catering by Friesen Brothers. You can learn more by visiting cateringbyfriesen.com or go see them in store. And hey, talking of wind, talking about solar, talking about renewables, nobody does renewables like Kubi Renewable Energy. They're Western Canada's busiest solar installer. And if you check out the careers link at kubienergy.ca right now, you'll see they're hiring. They're inviting you to join their team as they grow clean energy in Canada. Whether you're an installer, maybe you've got your ticket, maybe you're an apprentice, maybe you work in HR, maybe you're great at sales. Kubi would love to talk to you. They've got team members working in Alberta and BC, and they're reshaping Canada's energy portfolio. You can check out the careers link today. Maybe it's the first day of the rest of your life at kubienergy.ca. Our thanks to Alberta Premier uh, Daniel Smith for joining us. Obviously, uh, you know, got to as much as we could. I want to thank the literally hundreds of Real Talkers that submitted questions. If you missed our March 13th episode, we dedicated about 45 minutes of it to reading your takes, to, to reading your perspectives on the number one issue facing you, your family, your business, whether you live in the province of Alberta or beyond. It was a great exercise to understand where you're coming from, to understand the lens through which you're going to watch an interview like what we just did. We wanted to bring on the two credible voices, two people who've walked a lot of miles in the political arenas who understand what they're looking for to, to analyze that interview, to debrief after our conversation one-on-one -on -one with Premier Smith. And it's a pleasure to welcome back to the program, longtime political columnist Graham Thompson and former Calgary City Councilor Jeremy Farkas. Uh, welcome to the both of you. Thanks for making time for us uh, today. Graham, maybe we'll uh, start with you. What, what, what particularly jumped out at you in our conversation with Premier Smith. Well, you know, I think she's a great communicator. You know, you can mm -hmm. see she's very smooth. She's done this a lot of times, being a politician as well as having her own um, talk show as well. Um, just, there's so much to unpack. But one of the things, of course, you, you mentioned it right away, was Bill 11, this idea of a police force. Now, the government's saying, look, you know, we're not necessarily having our own police force. This is, of course, this is an idea of setting up a police force or a police service for the sheriffs. But this is very much a huge step towards setting up an Alberta police service, as simple as that. Something that she promised uh, during the leadership race for the UCP a couple of years ago, then it went silent. In fact, it seemed that she was backing away from it completely, and now they're bringing it back. And so the uh, minister responsible, Mike Ellis, said yesterday, look, uh, we're just getting ourselves ready for any eventuality in case the RCMP wants to withdraw its service from Alberta. There's no indication that's going to happen. The contract is up, though, in about another eight years. But this is something that's happening with, with Smith. All these issues that she brought up during the leadership race that she went silent on, including the pension plan, you raised that issue, of course. This is something that they're pushing ahead now. So even though she is very good at communicating what she is saying she's trying to do, when it comes to these promises, it's all about context. And that's things like the pension plan is back. The police force idea is back. 
Uh, this idea of um, the renewables, he got into that as well. This idea that um, the context here is that she doesn't like renewables. She spoke out against them in the past. And now, of course, the government uh, clamped down on it. And even now, when she's lifted the moratorium, it's been called a soft moratorium. There's all kinds of questions. But the thing is, there's so much going on with her. She's so, so good at, at communicating it that um, it's, it's a fire hose of information of changes to the political culture of Alberta. It's hard to keep up. Uh, Jeremy, welcome to the show. Welcome back. Uh, what jumped out at you? Well, I have to agree a lot with what was previously said there. I think this version of Danielle Smith is very different from what we saw, say, in the lead up to the 2012 election. As the leader of the Wild Rose, I think uh, many of her friends and also critics would say that she was ideological a bit to a fault, right? But what we're seeing in uh, Danielle these days is very practical. It's very pragmatic. It's very political. Uh, she's so she's really shown herself as being a political survivor. But I'd say that the broader calculus here is the UCP is really backed into a corner on the financial issues, the fiscal conservative things, uh, say tax relief. Uh, even with this uh, year's budget, they're going to have to borrow to be able to generate their paper surplus. So without uh, sort of that red meat for the fiscal conservatives, they really have to throw a lot of other things to the base, uh, uh, other issues that are not really monetary in dimension. So for example, the Alberta pension plan, think about the, the wind and solar uh, moratorium, uh, the reopening sort of the trans issue, the parental rights arguments, even municipal parties, right? Uh, so there's a lot of these things that I feel that probably Danielle is quite uh, wanting to be responsive for her own political survival, right? She's going into a leadership review. She's gonna to have to have something to show to this base. And, uh, you know, I just, I can't help but observe that change in Danielle, like uh, having worked alongside her in the Wild Rose days as a constituency association president, in meetings with her, she'd really always start uh, the conversation in terms of, is this the right thing to do? We're, nowadays, and a lot of the things that are being brought up, it's, what does the polling say? And I think that that tells a broader picture. And and don't get me wrong, I think that the government of the day, is, it should be responsive to the polling, but you have to balance what the immediate political survival needs are with the broader long-term benefits to the community and the province as a whole. Yeah, that's great insight. Uh, I appreciate that. Graham, did, did you buy her, her justification for no income tax cut in this budget? I mean, you know, if, if I was her political opponent, I mean, that's a broken promise. That's what that is, plain and simple. Yeah. Absolutely. And she kept delaying it. You know, I asked her during the year ender in December, you know, um, did you expect it to be phased in, not just one lump? To, yeah, the whole plan all along was to phase it in over time. Of course, she didn't say that during the election campaign day one. She's talking about um, balancing the budget being the first priority. But her first promise in the election campaign day one was that tax break. It's definitely a broken promise. And the thing is, yes, the money isn't there. So they're spending a lot of money. But the thing is, she's now acting as if um, it's a surprise that we're overly reliant on the you know, oil and gas revenue. That's been an issue for some time, and it's still a big issue. And she was talking, of course, in that uh, address to the public on television a few weeks ago about let's build up the Heritage Savings Trust Fund. They are putting $2 billion into the fund this year, but after that, they're kind of leaving it alone, hoping it grows through the magic of compound interest. But uh, as for polls, and I, and I think Jeremy is right in terms of um, she does look at the polls, but then having said that, looking at the polls, Albertans don't want a pension plan. Over 50% roughly are dead set against it, but she's saying they just need more information, so she's just ignoring the, the polls on that. But it comes to the police force. A lot of the uh, uh, local governments across the province have said, no, they don't want that. The moratorium on renewables, uh, she couldn't explain why she brought that in. Um, she talked about the, the um, regulators wanted it. Well, that's not true. Uh, local governments asked for it. That's not true. They should blame the federal government. So I think at this time, though, even when it comes to the idea of bringing in uh, partisan politics to local civic elections, uh, there's very few people asking for that. So I do question if they're always following the polls. It seems very often they're pushing things on Albertans, like the pension plan, um, the police force, uh, civic um, governments getting involved in uh, partisan politics. It seems they're pushing an agenda that doesn't seem to be related to the polls and what Albertans want. Yeah, Jeremy, I don't know if I expected her to, to 
you know, wrap up the APP with a bow and, and set it on the shelf and close the door for good in the interview. I don't think I expected her to acknowledge that it's a wildly unpopular idea and the majority of people don't want it. But I was a little bit surprised, to be honest with you, that she appears to still be in the camp that it's a good idea. I mean, she told us that if it went to referendum, and obviously it's her call whether or not she sends it there, that she'll vote for it. So she she still appears to believe that it's a, a good idea. Are you surprised by that? You know, I don't think it's a political mistake for her. And don't get me wrong, uh, I disagree with the idea of an Alberta pension plan. But I think it really it builds her brand, right? Uh, she's an exceptional communicator. And myself, I consider her to be a friend. Uh, she's very empathetic. Uh, when you sit down with her, you are she is engaged with you like nothing else. Uh, no other politician on this planet will give you 110% of their attention when they're sitting down with you one-on-one. -on -one. And Danielle is that type of politician. But the reason politically, at least as a bargaining chip, that the, the pension plan is useful is that it it builds her brand, right? She's uh, the, the fact that it's on the table is something unpopular, that uh, it's not going to fly because not, like a, a majority of uh, UCP voters are opposed to it. That's the real reason it won't fly. But it's a bargaining chip, right? If you throw 10 unpopular things and you only really intend to get done, say, three or four, the other six that you back down on or you compromise on, it only builds your credibility as somebody who's willing to listen to feedback, right? So the fact that there's so many unpopular things all at once, you know, this, is, this isn't a bug. It's a feature of that overall strategy. Uh, Graham, was there anything that the uh, premier said in that interview that, that jumped out at you, that, that a big red flag that popped up and you went, well, that's just simply not true. Uh, did she lie about anything in that interview as far as you could tell? Well, the issue of renewables, this is an ongoing issue where she's making it sound like, you know, all we're doing here is just you know, protecting farmland and um, we're going to make sure that we have enough power, of course, to uh, protect Albertans during cold days. The thing is, I should talked about uh, a lot of renewables, but not seem to say not a lot of other uh, natural gas plants coming on. Now, maybe I misheard her because there are, according to the, the Globe and Mail article in December, there's three major natural gas plants coming on stream this this year, this spring. That's going to uh, bring down, we hope, the price of uh, of power to Albertans. But such so as going on this um, this argument that um, natural gas is you know, basically um, something that we need to protect. But the thing is we have more plants coming on and it's sort of this narrative that renewables uh, will, let, will leave us freezing in the dark when you've got, for example, her argument that the renewables are uh, eating up uh, lots of good farmland. There's a report out yesterday from the um, Alberta Utilities Commission saying that, um, that that's not true, that uh, most of the, the solar and wind farms are on uh, land that's not great for farming. And even if all the the projects went ahead, it might use up about 1% of all the good arable land in the next, uh, like, well, next 10 or well, 20 years almost. So you have these arguments being blown up when they actually look at these arguments that she's uh, made against renewables. They tend to get undermined by scientific facts. And in fact, as a, a lawyer, uh, uh, sorry, a, a law professor at the University of Calgary has said, yeah, this report yesterday blows up most of her arguments when it comes to uh, renewables. So she's saying things, and she is a really good communicator. When you actually dig into these things, you find that um, things aren't as straightforward as she makes them out to be. And we can go back over the pension plan, this idea that you know life works the same. We can get $334 billion out of the Canada pension plan. No one really believes that. Experts don't believe it. So there's things that you dig into and you realize things aren't as cut and dried and straightforward as she makes them appear to be. And it comes to renewables. They say just yesterday, a report came out that kind of um, undermines one of, um, some of her major arguments against uh, renewable solar and wind farms. Jeremy, any red flags, any blatant lies that you detected? Well, you know, and, and this was an issue that really stumped me as a, a city councillor, right, as a, in Calgary here, essentially acting as a shareholder and max, like the electricity issue is just so hella complicated. And uh, anyone who's selling you very simple solutions, uh, 
either in terms of a quick fix or even their theories of why it was broken. I don't think that they've captured 100% of it. Uh, I would say just within my own experience as a city councillor, though, uh, we advocated on behalf of the consumer when the Alberta government at the time wouldn't. Uh, we engaged uh, through NMAX uh, and through our own uh, intergovernmental committees, essentially applying for intervener status, fighting for the consumer, right? So I think that it wasn't quite fair to, to pin sort of the current electricity issue on the municipal council and mayor when we were actually fighting and we were advocating for changes to the system and we were part of the early warning system in terms of calling out uh, the, the natural end game of the situation that we have now. So I didn't feel like that was uh, incredibly fair, but maybe I feel personal about it because uh, I was in the, in the you room. Were with involved. A lot of those you were involved. You were getting called out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, well, well, that opens the door for me to ask you about Nahed Nenshi. And I think she saw an opportunity to take a, a subtle swipe at Nenshi. Um, and uh, she, she didn't really take the bait did she we, we we played the clip of him going through his laundry list of, of criticism of her record um obviously put it in front of her that he's calling her immoral and dangerous uh jeremy you know him very well uh obviously during your time together on council you, you, you weren't allies uh that's fair to say but you've had can i say kind words of support even publicly for Nancy over the past few days since he's declared his candidacy to lead Alberta's NDP. Take, take us into this. Yeah, so I, I don't mean to be uh, too uh, critical of the media, but part of it was the portrayal. And, you know, I'll own my share of it where, you know, it was politically advantageous to me to sort of play up that rivalry sure and i think it was it was it was advantageous to him as well to play up the rivalry but anyone who sort of worked with us at city hall even the media and other friends like they know that we got along and i think to his credit uh, he he would drop whatever he was doing if i ever had a had an issue if i could i could walk into his office with an open door policy and i i did that uh, pretty frequently so there's a lot of things that we actually were allies on things like uh, restoring the city of Calgary summer student program, uh, fixing lead water pipes in the inner city, uh, his uh, notice of motion on uh, community action on mental health and addiction. Uh, th this guy is a formidable opponent, right? I I've really seen him up close. Uh, I've seen him as a leader does. I I he can be very generous with praise. Uh, he's willing to let others uh, take a credit for the achievements that were uh, rightfully his. He's willing to sort of take the bullet when other people make mistakes. He's willing to stand up and be the guy who gets blamed for things. And for me, from a, as a political opponent, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a, embarrassed to admit this, but you know, I took advantage of that fact where you know I was willing to blame him for things that I knew in good conscience were not actually his fault, right? And that's something that I'm I'm willing to admit and apologize for, but. While, while he could be really demanding, I found that he was also open to compromise, right? So just as long as I came prepared. So what I'd say, at least on a on a political level, is conservatives uh, and new Democrats, they, they won't like me saying this, but I would say underestimate this guy at your own peril, right? So if you're going to jump into the boxing ring with somebody, understand their pros and their cons objectively. Otherwise, you're going to get punched in the face. Obviously, he, he has a lot of baggage. Uh, taxes went up. Uh, but and he had, he does have an ego, right? So he's not as smart as he thinks he is. But you know, you do not win three back to back to back contested elections in Alberta's biggest city against some extremely motivated, some extremely well financed opponents without a team and without being a leader. So you need to understand those qualities objectively. But I'd say just for a moment on the personal level, like after my loss in the 2021 uh, municipal election, I had so many Fairweather friends who ran for the exit. Uh, they, they did the calculation. They thought that I was no longer useful to them. And to my astonishment, and I shouldn't have been surprised, but I still was. But Nenshi was the opposite to me. And, you know, despite having so many uh, uh, political differences uh, and really having every reason to gloat and to lord it over me, he never once did. And he stepped up really meaningfully uh, to support me in practically every single thing I wanted to do. And and we've discussed my run from Mexico to Canada and other things, but I had some really impractical goals, but he was there for me immediately. And uh, he, at the center of it, he never doubted that I had a contribution still to make, even when I really doubted myself. So mm -hmm. the reason I say this is that these are obviously all very priceless qualities in a friend. And I think conservatives are exactly right to, to fear those qualities in a potential opposition leader. And lastly, to answer your question directly, I think Danielle was right in terms of not taking the bait. You know, I think it was Sarah Hoffman did a tweet where, he, where she said every time then she said something, I get two memberships. 
And I think every time Danielle Smith says anything about Nenshi, he probably gets 10, right? So I think it's safer. Uh, the UCP does not want to fight Nenshi. They would much rather fight somebody like Gil McGowan or Sarah Hoffman. So I would see them actually trying to... Uh, uh, downplay their their concerns about him. Yeah, well, I mean, no offense to Gil McGowan whatsoever, but there's not a chance in hell that he's winning the leadership, so I'm not going to entertain that idea. No offense. That's just a fact. Uh, there are front runners and there are not. Graham, if you were sort of ranking him right now, if Las Vegas called you to put the book together, <laughs> uh, who's the favorite here? Depending on who you talk to, the front runner is either Nenshi or Hoffman with honorable mention to Pancholi. How are you wrapping your mind around it? Yeah, it's Nenshi right now. Of course, the thing is, even though he sat on Monday, you know, I'm not the front runner, I'm the underdog. He wants to be painted as the underdog because the thing is, if you're too overly confident, uh, that turns people off. And also, you want to convince your supporters to get out there and buy a membership. Um, but I'll say right now, even though he hasn't sold memberships, he started on Monday, um, he's definitely the front runner. And I think that he'll be selling memberships. He said he had 500 people uh, at his launch. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. He only has uh, like less than six weeks to sell the memberships. The cutoff's April 22nd. Uh, you mentioned Hoffman. Yeah, she's a real force in uh, Edmonton, of course. Ganley, in some ways, was seen as sort of the front runner as well. Uh, Pancholi, she's um, relatively new on the scene. Um, but I think it's, it's Nenshi. It's like Nenshi is the one we're talking about. No one else. Uh, I've been doing national uh, columns on this. Uh, I've been talking on uh, national television and radio about this, about Nenshi. Like no one else has called me up saying, can you talk about uh, Gil McGowan? Can you talk about you know, Recky Pancholi? They're all interested in Nenshi. So I think absolutely, even though he hasn't sold as many memberships, I bet, as anybody else. We've got a month I had uh, had start on him. It's definitely Nenshi. He has, we're talking about him, but also I think that he has um, people behind him, and Jeremy uh, almost seems like he was um, going to join the NDP. I'm not saying you are to vote for him, but when you have people like that who know him, and you got people who are attacking him, and right now the UCP, you go on social media, they're setting their hair on fire when it comes to um, to Nenshi, and you can see they wouldn't be saying that unless they were concerned at the very least about him. Jason Nixon uh, mentioned Nenshi, uh, you know, in the House on Monday. So t- try to tie him seem to Stalin, but they're talking about him. This is, and you're right. I think that uh, Smith is smart not to talk about him, not to get into the. Uh, in fact, he, she said, I don't, she didn't even mention his name. I think she talked about um, the the guy who was just the person who was just speaking is how she referred to yes. him. Yes. Uh, at one point, she so didn't want to give him the a, sound bite. <laughs> that's a, a page from Lawheed who said, never mention your opposition by name. Mm. So, yes, they're concerned. And she said, look, wait till the um, the battle is done, and then we'll get into policy discussion. But right now, they're needling the NDP. This is the UCP saying, hey, what kind of party are you going to be? They are uh, suggesting that Nancy wants to take or hijack the NDP and take it over. And that's, I think, trying to um, uh, cause some consternation among the other candidates in the race. But going back to your question, Right now, I would say hands down, it's definitely Nenshi is the front runner. Yeah, but Mark's in our live chat saying, enough about Nenshi. He says there's five other candidates. <laughs> enough about Nenshi. Let me just say this to Mark and others. I think he knows. Um, if you check out our archives on YouTube and on the podcast, you can find our interviews one-on-one with all of the leadership candidates. That includes uh, Nahed a couple of days ago. Of course, we've also spoken with the very impressive Jody Callahue Stonehouse. Uh, we've talked to Racky. We've talked to Kathleen. We've talked to Sarah. And we will be extending an invitation, obviously, to Gil McGowan. I understand he's been fighting COVID, but I'm, I'm curious to pick his brain on whether or not he thinks a big, prominent, outspoken union boss uh, can win the leadership of Alberta's official opposition. It'll, it'll be interesting. Um, interesting to hear the premier acknowledge that what's happening with the Red Deer Catholic School Board is not in the spirit of her policies. They're being described, Jeremy, as the, as the trans policies, but obviously kind of an omnibus announcement uh, involving a whole bunch of stuff. You have gone to the wall, Jeremy, uh, with your support of the LGBTQ2S plus community, and, and I want to pick your brain on this. On, on one hand, um, you, it, it is impossible to ignore uh, the, the advocates and allies that have been protesting and demonstrating loud loudly against Alberta's policies for a long time. Uh, We've seen voices pop up in Saskatchewan, New Brunswick as well. Meantime, you see stories like this one out of the UK just yesterday. The health service in England is curtailing puberty blockers for minors, uh, drugs available now only as part of research studies. It's happening in other parts of the world. Polling shows 
that it's not as unpopular as you might think. But I suspect that you're going to tell us that this is one of those incidents that you were just describing, where it's not all about the polling. Where are you at with this? Oh, boy. Let, you know, I'll start by just talking about language and the language around this debate. It is so frustrating and so troubling. So let's start here. So d- describing medically necessary treatments as, quote unquote, mutilation is is it is so utterly inaccurate. And I'm not saying that you did, but there, there's so many proponents on this issue who are describing this as an issue of mutilation. It's it's so deeply hurtful. It is so inaccurate. So consider for a moment uh, a person in your life, uh, say, fighting breast cancer, for example. Think about how your words would impact them as they weigh having to have a medically necessary procedure. And I, I would say they are so much more beautiful for their fight. They're, they're not mutilated. They're not ugly. They are strong. They're beautiful. So the, the same applies for these kids and these young adults, like most of us will have no idea of the kind of mountain that they have to climb. So, you know, there's a lot of keyboard warriors, social media folks who will watch some garbage on Fox News or the latest that Tucker Carlson has said or the latest that their uncle has brought or their crazy uncle has brought to Easter dinner. But, you know, the facts are so important to talk about. And that is why, like, I think that the NDP and especially those who are, have some issues with this proposed policy as it's playing out uh, here in Alberta and other provinces, I think that they really have to navigate this issue carefully. So I think it's vital to understand that the the emotion driving this, it's not so much hate, it's not so much bigotry, I think it's fear and I think it's misunderstanding. And you can't uh, vilify those who frankly have a lot of questions. And I think to, to talk about the polling, uh, what the polling says is that people are not so much uh, opposed to the LGBTQ community. They're not opposed to transgender people, but you know, people are afraid, right? They're they're They want to be involved in what's going on in their kids' lives. And they don't feel like they have adequate in- information at this point. So, you know, it's, it's just so challenging when, you know, you'd think that this is an argument that you would win sort of facts versus facts, but the, the primary emotion here is, is one of fear and misunderstanding. And what I would say is for the sort of the mushy middle, the people who are undecided, who could go either way, if you're somebody who's advocating for the community right now and you're portraying those undecided folks as as uh, hateful or, or bigots, then you're going to lose them, right? So I think that there needs to be a little bit of more empathy on all sides on this, not to make this a both sides thing. And there's no false equivalency here. Like human rights are not determined by poll. You know, if we took polls on, say, slavery or whether women can vote. Uh, we know how those would have uh, been answered, right? So human rights are so fundamental. But, you know, you sort of pulled my string <laughs> on this. But I, I think there, we could go into, like, the, the nitty-gritty of what uh, uh, the Premier had said in her video. I think that there's some inaccuracies in there. Uh, but at the, car, at, the, at the core of it, I think that the Albertans are generous. We're kind. We're empathetic. We're willing to uh, be good neighbours. But... Uh, This is such a horrible, (laughs) horrible topic because it feels like both sides have been so entrenched and there's not a lot of room for any kind of dialogue in the middle. Yeah. And we've talked about this on the show. I don't I don't blame people that, quite frankly, uh, you know, want and I don't mean this as an insult or slight to anybody, but there's a lot of people that just don't want anything to do with this conversation. Right. Because they're they're concerned that 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 it's going to pit them against their friends and neighbors. They don't have a, a full understanding. They're afraid of saying the wrong thing. They do believe believe that parents need to obviously play a huge role in you know in in the rearing of their children but they also believe that vulnerable kids need to be protected i mean obviously that seems to me uh to be two beliefs or two values that you can hold congruently uh graham was there anything that you wanted to add to that yeah it's interesting you know the thing is smith is not a social conservative absolutely not like she's been a supporter of um a gay lesbian lgbt lgbtq uh plus community for for years actually the thing is so uh, what's happening here is context. And earlier, Jeremy mentioned that uh, leadership um, you know, review coming up this, this fall. So the thing is, last year, the context is take back Alberta. You know, the, the right wing group, socially conservative group has been pushing Smith on this very issue now for about, about a year. And so last fall, when you had the big UCP annual general meeting, three and a half thousand people, the biggest turnout ever in Alberta history for a political convention, almost 4,000 people. Uh, on the eve of that, uh, David Parker put out a tweet saying basically to the UCP, hey, UCP leadership, meaning Danielle Smith, you better listen to the grassroots on this issue uh, this weekend. Um, 
And so then she did a speech the following day or two days later, the following day, uh, where she talked about parental rights and got a huge standing ovation. And then the question was, what are we going to do about this, uh, Premier? You've talked about this. And then she brings out this idea that gender issues, uh, which is playing into the narrative of uh, people Jeremy's talked about, you know, people who think that children are being mutilated, um, you know, uh, and the woke teachers uh, trying to sexualize them. But she's playing into that, that narrative. She doesn't believe that. I, you know, I think that she's very still very progressive on this issue, but she is playing to them because she has a leadership race coming out, sorry, not race, a, a review in the, the fall. And the thing is, she talked about these issues in that um, a few weeks ago in that uh, video and then had a news release uh, about it the following day, but she's doing nothing about it really until the fall. And that's because I would say it's take back Alberta and making sure that she's going to do the right thing in their eyes ahead of that leadership review. She doesn't want to lose him because, listen, they helped bring down um, Jason Kenney. And she doesn't want them to be offside when it comes to this review. It's really important to her. And then going back to the original point, you're talking about the Catholic school board. Um, the, the, in Red Deer, yeah, they've gone a lot further than, than Smith has talked about. And again, she has not brought in any sort of regulation or any sort of, re uh, of legislation. But they're jumping ahead of what she is talking about. And she is concerned. But the thing is, she opened the door to this. She is playing into that narrative of people who are spreading misinformation. And she's doing it, I would say, for political reasons, because Take Back Alberta is breathing down her neck. Graham, I, you're, you're my, like, uh, if I'm ever doing, like, Alberta politics trivia night at the bar, I'm taking you with me every <laughs> single time. And I have a, I, I want to ask Jeremy a question, but I, maybe I'll put it to both. Do either of you remember, what were Jason Kenney's specific comments? He didn't mention Take Back Alberta, but but in his in his waning days as Alberta Premier, he described, he sort of had that 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 presser, remember, Graham, where he said, like, the call is coming from inside the house. Like, he, he oh, described... Oh, it was the lunatics. Uh, lunatics of the asylum. Lunatics. lunatics <laughs> taking over the asylum. Yeah, okay, so both of you... Him Yes. So this was not him talking about, and he had, he had that speech, I guess, he gave uh, to um, people in his staff, and someone recorded it, and he right. was talking about lunatics taking over the asylum. Uh, so this is something, yeah, this is Take Back Alberta. Yeah, so, um, okay, they, so both of you, by the way, are invited to, to pub night at the trivia. You both got it at the same time. Apologies <laughs> to you, Jeremy, but, but Graham, give us the story there. Yeah, so this was, um, of course, this is, uh, during the uh, pandemic, how did the pandemic, uh, you had people like Take Back Alberta, David Parker, uh, who actually supported uh, Kenny in the leadership, helped make him uh, leader and then premier. And he thought that uh, Kenny was going way too far, second people's rights, you know, stepping on our toes and, and too many restrictions during the pandemic. And then he, he co-founded Take Back Alberta to fight against Kenny on this. And this became an issue, let's get rid of Kenny. And he helped bring down Kenny. Kenny won a million votes, the UCP won a million votes uh, in 2019. But enough people, like 16,600 people, uh, voted against Kenny in that leadership uh, review. And that basically brought him down, forced him out. And this was not, this is David Parker being very efficient when it came to uh, attacking uh, uh, Kenny. So this was something Kenny did not talk about, take back Alberta by name. But this is who he's referring to. And they did bring him down. And they did help um, Smith become the leader, of course, and then premier. And this is something that she's really beholding to them, beholden to them. But also, I would say she's also frightened of them because they have shown what they can do when they are organized. And she knows she doesn't want to get it out of step with them because they can cause her real trouble. They can. And and Jeremy, I'm curious for your take on this, like the, the state of the party or the influence on the party. I would I would probably describe that group, the, the, the lunatics, so to speak, to use Jason Kenney's word, to be more emboldened now than they were when he said that. So you could probably suggest accurately, I, I would argue that they have more power and influence now than before. But on the flip side, you, you, you could run out another leader. Uh, you, you, you could create another scenario where the United Conservatives are, are floundering uh, optically or otherwise to find a leader that would become premier at the same time that the NDP's got a new breath of life under a new leader who knows who it'll be. We can all make our assumptions. They've got fundraising and membership sales happening. It could put the United Conservatives in a tough spot. It, it, it could be a risky move, couldn't it? I mean, all things considered. Well, I think they're at the micro and the macro level. So the, the micro. So for for example, for me as somebody who values say a, a smaller 
more effective government. I value parental rights. I, I value bodily autonomy. An issue like this is a it's an interesting wedge if it w- weren't so dangerous, right? So you, you, what's actually being proposed through this policy is actually reducing uh, the rights of parents, right? So there's many sort of social liberals or libertarians who are gravitated to the wild rose based on sort of a live and let live get government out of the the way of these decisions, period, who are being alienated by this. So uh, that's one piece. On the macro, though, it's I think it's a big danger for the UCP to be out there on so many issues that, uh, frankly, they didn't campaign on or they uh, bluntly said that they weren't going to raise if they were reelected, right? So I think that how the NDP eventually lost uh, their very viable chance at reforming government was because they became known as well. They're just going to be going and doing all these other things they didn't campaign on. They're going to be raising taxes. They're going to be uh, bringing in a carbon tax. They're going to be doing all of these other things. And I think that in the big picture, I think the UCP stands uh, that same vulnerability, right? If, if you If you don't have your credibility, you have nothing. And I think at the center of Daniel Smith's strengths and her her greatest pros as a candidate is that anyone who uh you pull off the street a typical ucp voter they'll tell you well she she calls it like she sees it uh, she says she'll she'll do certain things and she she follows through right lover or hater she she's an honest politician is what many people would tell you whether you agree with that or not but it really cuts to the bone if uh, all of a sudden they're in a situation where they're having to break their promises for tax cuts. They're having to bring up all of these other issues for the short-term survival. So I think in the big picture, this stands to really tank uh, the prospect of the UCP's credibility amongst those folks, especially with all these sort of fringe and uh, socially really alienating issues. Uh, the UCP is really strongest when they're focused on those bread and butter issues. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I want to thank the both of you for being here. We, we wanted to have, you know, sort of a debrief session. I love doing stuff like this. And and a couple of uh, credible, formidable fact checkers uh, standing by ready to go. So I thank you for filling that role. Before we thank you both for your time, was, was there anything else? I don't want to leave anything on the table. Any Anything from that interview, uh, Graham, I know you to be one who makes notes. You're like me. You're scribbling on paper all the yeah. time. Uh, was, was there something else that the premier gave us this morning that either surprised you or, or, or was cause for concern uh, as a journalist from an accuracy standpoint? Well, I mentioned renewables. Yeah. And I mentioned, um, you know, the, the, th- the thing right now, uh, the newest thing, of course, is this whole police force. Um, the government's trying to make it sound like, hey, this is no big deal. We're just doing this, you know, just to protect Albertans. But this, this is creeping changes, major systemic changes to our system of government in Alberta with things like um, the, the police force, a pension plan, uh, getting uh, local uh, elections involved with partisan politics. So the thing is, you listen to her, she sounds very credible, but you actually dig into these issues, like renewables, I say, and you, these, these arguments start falling apart when you dig into them in terms of the government. So um, I, I did think it was uh, telling, again, that she is concerned about what's actually happening in the Catholic school board. She says she is very concerned about that. But again, she opened the door to this. She shouldn't be surprised at all that she's done this. So there's a lot of things, it's a fire hose. There's so many different things uh, happening at once in Alberta. It's hard to keep track. And the thing is, it's going back to um, to Kenny. He talked about this before the election. I think it was in 2000, what election he won. Um, he talked about this, about the idea of changing at a pace that the opposition can't keep up. People who are opposed to you making changes, what you do, you just bring up a million different changes at once and people just cannot respond to it all. I think this is actually happening now with Smith. A lot of changes that, that she's admitting to and there's changes that she's not admitting to and this goes back to the election campaign where she's very good at ducking issues she doesn't want to talk about but then making the other issues sound very credible when in fact, if you dig into them, you find that um, they're often full of hot air. Mm, appreciate that, Graham. Last word to you, Jeremy. Same question. You know, I think every single one of the NDP leadership candidates would do well to watch Daniel Smith's interview with you, Ryan. I think what you saw was a politician in their prime at their best. You don't have to like her uh, as a person or as a politician to really understand what our strengths are. I think in the NDP leadership race right now, I think you have multiple candidates making bets on what the appropriate strategy would be. Like you have Nehed Nenshi coming in hot 
uh, as the ultra partisan, somebody who thinks that uh, the base wants a fighter. Uh, you have Raki Pancholi and others who have more of a, a focus on the broad uh, vision. But I think uh, underestimate her at your peril, right? Especially as we move into uh, a situation in politics and the media where it doesn't so matter uh, what you say, the facts could uh, be lies for all anyone cares, but it's so much uh, it's so much important to how people feel, right? And uh, I think that it's it's an interesting time to be in politics, especially having known a lot of the contenders uh, on a personal level and having worked with them. But you know, if I could give a final word, uh, I would just return back to this uh, so-called parental rights policy, right? Uh, on a personal note, I couldn't, I can't overstate the impact that it would have had on me as a young person. Uh, uh, growing up LGBTQ was was challenging enough uh, without these kinds of policies that really threaten to out young people uh, before they're ready or to otherwise deny them access to essential care. And, you know, I wouldn't be alive today if I didn't find the support that I could in the teacher. And I'm not so sure that this would be allowed under the, the what's being proposed by the UCP. So, you know, I would just very directly appeal to uh, my friends in the party, to the premier directly in terms of their humanity, right? Please please be cautious as you're implementing these things. Think about what the long-term view is, not about your current immediate short-term survival. Think about these things, think about these kids, think about people like me and others uh, who are vulnerable and want you to do the right thing because we know that you can, so you must. That's powerful stuff. Uh, appreciate that very much. That's Jeremy Farkas. Uh, we've also been joined by Graham Thompson. Uh, to the both of you, we appreciate your time. Thanks for this. Uh, hey, by the way, I, I should have read this. I, I saw something in our live chat. I wanted to read this to you. Somebody somebody described both of you as, as intelligent. Uh, this was from Galena, who said, good conversation with intelligent guests. So there you go, fellas. A bouquet for you. <laughs> Good stuff. Thank you so much. Yeah, give them yeah. both a follow. You can uh, find Graham, of course. Uh, well, our, our uh, Twitter account, Real Talk RJ. We let you know the handles of the guests that'll be joining us each and every morning. You'll find Graham and Jeremy on Twitter. I encourage you to give them a follow, and, and you can keep up with their commentary uh, moving forward and down the line. Uh, in just a second, want to get Johnny and I had an interesting exchange yesterday. You and I talking about uh, polytechnic schools and trades and people, you know, looking at alternative uh, post secondary paths, alternative career paths. Yeah, uh, how university is not a solution or, or not the right fit for everybody and we got two really great emails uh, that I want to make sure that we leave time uh -oh. to read uh, from for no this is it's really <laughs> positive and, and and it just broadens yeah like you and I kind of teed it up talking about you know maybe some stigma that, that maybe used yeah to we exist. said both sides we said yes it's a good idea but also yeah. you could be dangling a carrot at kids yeah you know, you know people who might are 18 and who who might want to not go on to secondary education because yeah. they could make six figures or, or, or they don't see a fit for them as, as sure. in, in like the sort of structured learning environment of your classic university. And Good so they and want, to, you know, something different. And so some great insights from real talkers, no surprise there. And we're going to get to that in just a sec. Plus I want to pick your brain on the premier's uh, interview. You were sitting right here. You had a front row seat. Uh, we'll get to Johnny in just a minute, but first I got to let every engineer that's listening to this, including maybe those of you that are uh, in university right now, earning your engineering degree, I want to let you know what's going on at Apex Automation. They're hiring right now. Apex Automation is looking for the most talented and skilled engineers in the country. You can learn more by checking out the careers link on their website, apexautomation.ca. They're working in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Texas, in a wide range of applications, uh, potash mining and, and natural gas processing and pipelines and, and well, you name it, plus Industry 4.0, Edge Computer, Computing, cyber security, Apex Automation is one of the fastest growing firms in the country, literally. And they'd love for you to join their team. You can learn more by visiting them online. Again, the careers link at apexautomation.ca. Our friends at Grand Dog Essentials Quality Raw Food are excited to let you know that they're working with a new supplier right now. There's a new product line. You can check out on their website, granddog.ca. Uh, it's the complete canine. This is an Alberta-based raw pet food manufacturer what makes them so special is that the food is prepared in a human grade federally inspected facilities they're one of the only raw manufacturers in alberta that can say this and they've got a ton of protein options we were talking about i think it was bison yesterday they got beef chicken kangaroo duck you're going what yeah these are great for pets with food sensitivities if you didn't even know that pets can have food sensitivities you got to take a few minutes check out the blog at granddog.ca 
www.ferrisdogs.ca. Great info and tips on feeding your dog and cat a raw food diet. Again, that's granddog.ca. And before we get to your emails, a shout out to our friends at Complete Care Restoration. Didn't get a chance to talk to Premier about the upcoming wildfire season. Obviously, it sucks to acknowledge that we know that we'll be doing shows about wildfires coming up in just a few weeks. They're expecting this to be one of the most serious serious wildfire seasons that that we've maybe ever seen drought like conditions all of this to say communities are going to be on high alert when it comes to wildfire preparedness when it comes to readiness and ultimately in some circumstances the gut punch of rebuilding properties if you find yourself in that scenario look to the team that has more than a quarter century of experience rebuilding peace of mind that's complete care restoration province-wide at CompleteCareRestoration.ca. Anything that jumped out at you in particular, our half-hour conversation with the Premier? I know we didn't get to everything we wanted to, but was there anything in particular that kind of resonated with you? No, not at all. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, Moving right no, along. I'm glad Graham brought it, brought it up because my, my mouth kind of dropped when – you know, little behind the scenes, we, we asked the premier, you know, if we if we were going to play this clip of Nenshi because we were obviously going to talk about him. Yeah. And the fact that she didn't mention his name and that Graham said that's right out of Lawheed's playbook. Yeah. How you never mention your opponent's name and how Graham also said that he's been asked for comments and every other person we've had on here <laughs> since uh, yesterday uh, or who we've talked to. Uh, no one's asking about the other candidates anymore. They're only asking about Nenshi. And when the premier doesn't mention a person's name, yeah. I'm not saying there's fear there, but that's a clear indication that she thinks he's the guy to beat. Yeah, the, the Rick Bell has, uh, we've reached out to Rick. I want to get him on the show in the next couple of weeks, columnist uh, down for the Calgary Sun. He's one of the one of our most wildly entertaining guests. He's great. For sure. Uh, and uh, But he's got back-to-back columns in the Herald this week. Number one, Nenshi claiming that the UCP is so scared of him and number two the UCP uh, a source within the premier's office saying that they are <laughs> salivating at the opportunity of, of running against uh, a Nenshi led party so and I think both of them like it, it, it's it's uh, like I love it I this is what I said yesterday I'm gonna love this when inevitably these two square off in a debate because you've got Nenshi like Graham says saying oh you know I'm not the front runner blah 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 playing that move where we all know he is and he probably does too trying to play down his ego and then you've got the UCP saying oh we're salivating at the chance to get at this guy when clearly if you're not mentioning his name in an interview you've got to have a little reluctance of getting in front of a mic you know toe-to-toe -to -toe with him yeah. so it's just I'm I'm salivating yeah. Ryan I'm ready to see them both on TV or on you know any kind of debate what right now it's obviously gonna He's be social media for the next first, two years right, right? like but, yeah we'll see we'll see the we'll see the NDP leadership debates first and, and those are gonna be yeah good and ones. I'm not ruling out the other candidates but I mean with all the the hubbub the last two days how yeah. can you not say that that he's not right up and, and 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 right now and i know it was annoying mark in our chat that's like enough nancy already but it's like you know respectfully it just he, he just declared it just happened he's a big name that made a big splash into the race it doesn't guarantee that he's gonna win uh but obviously we're gonna talk about it um a, a reminder too if you're all fired up about my conversation with danielle smith or something else we've been talking about on the show or something we're not talking about you know what goes down on friday's episode that's coming up tomorrow if you're listening to us daily we sure appreciate it the flamethrower presented by our friends at the DQs of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. They're all real emails to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Your chance to get whatever you need off your chest, uh, bringing us your hot takes uh, presented by the DQs of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Luke uh, wrote into the show, not a flamethrower, but uh, following Johnny and my conversation yesterday about the trades and about polytechnic schools and trade schools and high school students and the path toward uh, skilled uh, trades careers. Um, Luke says, I'm a third generation carpenter uh, with my red seal. So he's got his ticket. Says, I just want to comment on your brief foray into trades talk. In our society, there's a complete stigma against the trades and quite frankly, all forms of manual labor, says Luke. And I don't understand why bad grades have to equal trades uh, we should be and I bang on Luke he says we should be pushing our kids to achieve the highest grades they can but don't forget like when you put all the dummies into the trades Luke's words those are the guys who are like 
building your house and fixing your car? And do you really want to hear conversations like, hey, don't bother nailing that down. The inspector won't ever see it. When someone's building your house or renovating your property, we need smart, high achieving people in the trades because we're the ones doing the work, says Luke. What's the point of having a straight A student go on to design something only to have a dummy build it? That is one of the best emails we've received in a long time. And this one from Jeremy, who says, Jespo, Johnny, as far as the stigma around the trades, I don't believe it's an issue anymore. Says, I was a, an early member of that RAP program, R-A-P, uh, way back in 99. I was in grade 11. Oh, you're still a young buck, Jeremy. Uh, says, but also a first-year electrician apprentice. So grade 11, but a first-year apprentice. Uh, before when in grade 10, I'd never even heard of the trades, never even really thought of life past high school. But one day, the school passed around a questionnaire uh, to see if we were interested in a career in the trades. And I randomly heard that an electrician was a good job. So I ticked the box. And then the next thing I know, they're offering me the opportunity to work in the trades for a semester. And then I'd only have to go to school for one semester a year to complete my core subjects while getting paid more than what at the time was my part time after school job. It seemed like a dream come true. And I jumped on that opportunity for freedom from those tyrannical school teachers while hardly understanding what I was getting myself into. Now, Jeremy says, now let's fast forward to today. I just started my own company, which is the only way uh, that I see surviving this future world. And I feel for those that have to put every expense through after-tax money. I feel for those in the current day and age, people that are looking for prosperity, uh, recognizing the trades as a good option for them or for their partner. I think the only reason to push kids into the professional world uh, may have to do with how they're going to be treated. As a tradesman, I've been herded like cattle through large job sites. Uh, engineers, managers are often far better equipped than we are. There's no care for your work life experience until you're in high demand. Uh, Jeremy says, I, I just wanted to get this out there. You know, when I, when I worked myself into the engineering and management level of operations, it was very clear to see differences in appreciation, compensation, and perception of value. Now, this is a message to the parents. He says, the main reason that, that you're coaching your kids away from trades, maybe into academic professions, does it relate to the level of respect? Does it relate to the level of compensation, like pay? This is what, what all should tie into conversations. He says, you know, for example, when we talk to elected officials, even premiers, uh, when governments are using tax dollars to entice tradespersons from other places to come to Alberta, using tax incentives, they're interfering with the free market says Jeremy. I guess in a way, I'll comment on that in a sec. He says, but this is what conservatives claim to be against. It seems to me that conservative governments feel the only time it's acceptable to interfere in free markets is when it comes to labor disputes. By the way, like half of the city of Edmonton's workers set to strike. Uh, we'll be focusing on that. Says if there's a shortage in the trades, I suggest that the premier needs to work more with labor organizations as opposed to invoking tax incentives to increase immigration to Alberta. He says, I thought it was worth putting it out there. He says the result of what's happening right now is that many of workers who built these houses, they're not going to be able to afford to live in one. Just ask BC how that's working out. That from Jeremy. We sure appreciate you sharing your firsthand experience. I don't know that this is government uh, interfering with the free market by trying to entice or attract skilled workers. Uh, I think it's the government, and I'm not carrying water for them. I, this is just what I see uh, responding to what is a very real issue. Is hanging out with the CEO of one of our uh, valued partners just yesterday, uh, Jake Kubisky, the CEO of Kubi Energy. He's, I said, so what's your spring looking like? They're obviously bullish. They've got a lot. They've got more jobs ready to go uh, than they have in the company's history. And I said, what about skilled workers? And his eyes, just, he goes, oh, like they are doing every. That's just one company. They're doing everything they can, exploring every every single avenue to attract skilled workers to come work for them. And for that to happen, they got to get them to the province and they got to make that happen. We, we, we read an email yesterday. I have it right here from Mandy who talked to us about how BC's registered nurses, the RNs are, are making 12 bucks an hour more than in Alberta. And, and Mandy wants to know what Alberta is going to do to help solve the nursing shortage. What about the shortage in family doctors? What about the shortage in, well, it seems like just about everybody Right. This is a province where, like Jeremy's email just pointed out, cost of living, uh, housing costs are becoming more of a concern to people. I don't mean to diminish anyone's stresses, but they're not even close to housing costs in B.C. and Ontario. But that doesn't mean they couldn't get there. It doesn't mean that for a lot of families, they're still making really tough choices around. Are we going to have milk on our cereal or pay the power bill? Right. We all know that that's happening. 
And so what's the answer to all of this? It's why we look to government. They're the ones that are setting the policy. And we have to trust. We want They want us to trust, let me say, that they have a plan, that it's an informed plan, that it's going to work. But not everybody believes that. And when we hear from people like Jeremy and like Luke that are working in the trades, when we hear from people that are in charge of hiring for big companies, for small family-owned businesses, they're valuable perspectives because it's real life reporting. And we value that from you more than you know. You can email us anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. You can leave comments on any of our posts on Instagram, TikTok, or Twitter. Thanks for following us there at Real Talk RJ. We'll get to more of what you have to say tomorrow in the flamethrower that's coming up on uh, the March 15th episode of Real Talk. It's also, of course, as it's a Friday, going to mark our Real Talk roundtable. And we're going to step away from politics. We're going to talk about food. We're going to talk about hospitality. We're going to talk about the restaurant business from three that have been deemed to be the best in the biz. As we get into the pages of Edify's best restaurants issue, that's coming up on Friday's Real Talk. We hope you'll join us. In the meantime, thanks for sharing this episode. We'll talk to you soon. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer, Josh Dunford, technical producer, John Hicks, general manager, Katie Cook Chivers, account coordinator, Lawrence Durlego, human resources, Lena Shepard, website design, Mike Johnston, voiceover by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Sapria Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandi Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux.